I'm Leslie Nordea, and today on Perspective, we have Salt Rock resident and award-winning cinematographer, Graham Duane, in studio with us. Welcome, Graham. Thanks, Leslie. Graham, we're just so excited to hear about everything that you've been working on over the last few years. Mm. But before we dive into that, I want to find out, how did you first fall in love with filmmaking? What drew you into this as a career? Yeah, so again, I think, you know, the first thing I fell in love with was just wildlife. And, you know, my, my dad used to take me into the bush and I loved that from a very young age. And then, um, you know, as I, as I grew up, I found the, the urge to show people those things quite strong. You know, I wanted to, um, I wanted to take people to show them the amazing things that, that you know, that, that nature can teach you. And I'm, you know, not being a people person, <laughs> um, I, was, I was never going to be a tour guide. So the next best thing was, um, was film and photography. So um, I also inherited my, my mum's uh, artistic brain. So I, I, uh, I ended up going to film school um, and then sort of naturally gravitated back into natural history filmmaking um, just by default. I think it's just part of my character. And now your filmmaking has taken you all over the world. Yeah, so, I mean, it's been an interesting ride. I, you know, I began just helping a friend who was producing a documentary series and that, I, I, I never left the genre, you know, that was that. I, was, I started filming sharks, crocs and lions and here we are 25 years later and basically still doing the same thing, just on a bigger scale. Yeah. Yeah. And you even won a, an Emmy Award in 2012, I believe? Yes, that was yeah. So for National Geographic? Yes, so I won an Emmy in, in 20, for a production in 2012, um, a, a cinematography Emmy mm -hmm. for a, a series that Nat Geo did called Great Migrations. Um, and that, that sort of, look, I mean, you know, quite honestly, it's all, about, it's all about timing and luck winning something like that. You've got to be part of the right production. And it all depends who you're up against. But it really did um, sort of cement my career internationally. Mm. You know, I think people then looked at this little South African cameraman with a bit, you know, more respect, which sure. was nice for, for, you know, my ongoing work. Yeah. Yeah. But was it before or after that? Um, you were diving with sharks. You were filming with um, crocodiles. Mm. Was how did that all um, come to being? Tell me a bit about that. So the the beginnings were were interesting because it, it at one point I was spearfishing a lot, um, and that meant dealing with sharks pretty much every time you went diving. I mean, where where they fish, they're sharks. So we we learned their their body language and all sorts of things about bull sharks and duskies and and what have you, and. Um, when a friend of mine came along with a shark production, I found myself sort of quite well equipped just to take a camera instead of a spear gun and just free dive up to these sharks. And, and the results were um, pretty good at that time. I mean, you know, 25 years ago, there weren't a lot of people able just to go and film sharks. I mean, remember, this was pre-great white cage diving days. That was never on an option. Um, so the advantage of that is that we were free to do whatever we liked because there was no regulation. Yes. So we would go down to, to Hanspai and drive out to Dar Island and just jump overboard. And amazing. that was, it was the most amazing era because, you know, we ended up doing things with great whites that A, people had never done and B, that you can't do now because you're not allowed to. Yeah. It's regulated. Um, and that you know, because of that spearfishing background, I kind of became, you know, this is 20 years ago, I kind of became, I think I was the first cameraman to free dive with a white shark for a production. Sure. Um, that was groundbreaking footage though. Yeah, it was. It was, but it was, again, it was, it was that era where, um, you know, uh, uh, originality, which is so rare, was for the taking. You know, you could reinvent shark filmmaking if you were prepared to handle a little bit of risk you know and if you knew the animals yes. so it was it was I mean the timing was wonderful because you know as I said I you know I was equipped to do that because of my background with sharks and that 
production that I did for a friend of mine really put me on the map. Somebody from Nat Geo. Well, the film actually sold to Nat Geo. It was the first production that I did for them. And then I was then approached by their production arm directly to do a whole lot of subsequent things with sharks. And then that led to a whole lot of other subjects. So I guess I should be thankful for the, to the sharks for putting, putting me on the map in a way. And not eating you. And not eating me. <laughs> yeah, I'm still here. Yeah, still have all my digits. So yeah, it was, it was um, quite an unconventional career start, I suppose. Definitely. And did that lead to the diving with crocodiles? So the croc, the croc diving was a byproduct of that series that I started shooting. We finished the shark hour and the next hour that we had to produce was a crocodile hour. You know, we all know these, these apex predators sell very well on television. So um, the, I, had, I had a friend who was living in Botswana who had been scuba diving in the Okavango, sure. um, which we thought was crazy until we did it. And then, you know, you, you're introduced to a magical world under there that no one gets to see. It's the most amazing privilege. And slowly but surely, you know, we, we pushed that envelope. And he approached a small croc, and to his surprise, it was afraid of him. And then he, he sort of got a beer in his bonnet and said, no, come, let's go and actually look for crocodiles underwater. And that escalated to, across the course of four or five years, I guess, to us actually diving in the delta, lying next to four meter crocs on the bottom, on scuba. Which, yeah, which again is a, um, you know, it's, it, it sounds scary, but we, we kind of assess the risk quite carefully. And the backstory to that is quite interesting because, you know, the, the, the month that you dive, that pretty much the only month you can dive in the delta, is midwinter, the water drops to about 13, 14 degrees, crocodiles are reptile, metabolism slows down, stops eating. Okay. So it's a little loophole yes. that you can exploit. Um, and we also learned very quickly the do's and don'ts of, of diving with a croc, you know. Um, so your filmmaking is more, it's more about learning the animal's behavior and yeah. filming in a way that doesn't disturb them or doesn't upset them so that you can get like a natural, as close as possible. Yeah, it's a, it's a strange thing when I look back on past productions because I don't remember the film. I remember the experiences yes. with the animals. And uh, you know, when I analyze that, that's actually what drives me yeah. to do this because it's you know, you can learn things and work with those animals in ways that nor, you know, the average person can't mm. just because of experience and knowledge and time in the field. And, you know, my memory is a, is a, is a whole sequence of experience with creatures rather than images, yes. which is strange, you know, but then that's why I got into this in the first place. Yeah. Your love for animals. Yeah. And wildlife. Yeah. Yeah. And now your love for wildlife has taken you all the way to Mexico. And I believe that that film is up for also for a nomination for an Emmy. Yeah, there's a backstory there too. So my love for wildlife actually took me to a desk job, which okay. is more recently. Um, so I run a production company um, and I do still get out, but not as much. But one of the, yeah, one of the productions that, that I've overseen, um, in the last year was a film called Migrating to Mexico. And that was done in co-production with a, a Mexican company called Oscura, um, which is wonderful actually. Um, people we'd never met brought expertise to the table and it really worked out. They had some great cinematographers and that film has also been nominated for an Emmy, Cinematography Emmy. So technically it's not mine because I actually didn't film. But, but the, it's your company. It's the, the company. So it's, that must it's, be exciting it's our film. as a company. Oh, it's fantastic. I mean, it's such yeah. a great motivator for everybody. Um, and in a way, that production is a, is a real giant killer because it's up against much bigger, higher budget um, productions. And it's two little, relatively small production companies involved. Mm. So it's a great coup for us, you know. Um, and it's a... 
it's a validation that you are still doing something exceptional. You know, you're stuck out in the middle of nowhere and you don't know what the BBC is doing, for yes. example. But, you know, this is... Um, the guys should give themselves a pat on the back. It's a job well done, yeah. 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 And it's, it's excellence coming mm. out of South Africa and coming out of small town Belito is also very exciting for us. Yeah. It's what I learned about South African filmmakers is we've got some very talented, creative slash technical people, which is quite unusual if you think about that combination. And our, our South African cameramen are world class, actually. Um, and I've got a few friends who've won Emmys, South Africans. Uh, oh, that's fantastic. Yeah, it is. We're really good at that. Now, Graham, you've also, you're a, you're a local. Just mm. tell me a bit about growing up here, like mm. your family. Have you, have you been here a long time? Mm. So yeah, so my, my great granddad came here 110 years ago. Oh wow. Um, you'll see Knox Road down here, Little Maritzburg, yes. that's Samuel Knox. That was, okay. you know, our family property was kind of from where Salt Cafe is to about halfway to the Salt Rock Hotel, that block. Um, so yeah, I'm being quite entrenched in this area. Uh, it's actually incredible. Yeah, it really feels like home. And you know, when you travel and you come home, I'm always happy to come home. Mm -hmm. you, know, you can go to the shop on a Saturday morning and see 20 people that you know. I mean, where else can you do that? Even now, with it so built up, it still happens. Um, and it's, you know, that little village of friends is, I think, I think it's what's kept a lot of us here, you know. Um, and life is good here. You know, I grew up spearfishing on this coast um, and my kids now sit on their grandfather's knee, you know, he grew up here, my dad, and yeah, it's a, the legacy feels good. It's a wonderful place to, to have a family. It um, is, yeah. We're very lucky. Very yeah. tight-knit community. Yeah, it is. Underneath all the development, yes. there's a very tight-knit, um, a very tight-knit village, you know, which still exists. Yeah. So now with your company, Earth Touch. Do you have any projects on the horizon? Are you planning new things? Mm. Is it a constant thing all the time looking for new projects? It's relentless searching for new projects. So the way we put work into the company is we, we pitch projects about a year and a half, two years ahead of them actually delivering. Okay. So, you know, the projects that we're busy with now will, will deliver through 2022 and 23. Um, and yeah, we, I mean, we've had a quiet year because of the lack of travel. Mm. We've got a project in Patagonia that's on hold because we just okay. can't get in there. The national parks are closed. But um, the flip side of that is that, you know, we produce snakes in the city every year. Yes, and, and that's a very local production. Yeah, very that's local. That's quite popular. So yeah, Simon and Suze, they're, they're actually arriving in, in two weeks' time to do season eight, which is our eighth wow. um, season of the series and you know kind of household names in south africa and in this area that's a that's a wonderful um ongoing block of work for us i think you mentioned to me once before that you're bringing in a new element to that show yes so this year we have um a wonderful woman from the ananda valley that's okay. joining simon as an apprentice she's a uh, She's an exceptional person. I won't, I can't say too much. Yes. Um, I won't say her name, but you'll see her uh, soon enough on TV. Um, she's a real outlier uh, and keen to really get hands on with snakes and help people in the Nanda, mm. which is a problem that, that Simon and Suze have had. And all the call outs to Nanda, you know, it's so remote. Sometimes they just can't get there yeah. and people need help there. So she's, yeah, she, we've got high hopes for, for how that'll work out both for the show and for, yes. you know, when we're not filming. Well, that's, um, that's going to be an exciting development. I yeah, think. yeah. It, it, and it feels good to, you know, we've always tried to support the local snake catchers in that show. Um, and it feels good to sort of inject another one into the area. Um, and then, you know, we're also busy with quite a high profile single hour show on the sardine run this oh, okay. year, which we've just finished filming. And that's, you know, I think we've produced 280-odd films over the last 10 years. Jeez. Single-hour films. And 
Anyway, all of them excite me, but none quite like this one. Okay. It's, uh, yeah, it's, it's uh, the production name's called The Ocean's Greatest Feast. And um, it's an exceptional story with some amazing, the cinematographers outdid themselves again. Mm. So I'm really looking forward to that hitting the screens, which it will sort of halfway through next year. Okay. We start editing now. Now the sardine run is something that evokes emotions in South Africa and, yeah. and it's And we've had two really good ones, which is fantastic. Like a, yeah, for your yeah. filming. Yeah, yeah, just and, and for the ocean, you know. Mm. Um, there's a lot of you know, you're part of the story of the film is that all these associated predators just rely so heavily yeah. on those on those little fish. Yeah. And if they don't come it's a, it's quite devastating, you know, for dolphins. Whales, sharks, um, even orcas now feature quite strongly in our film, which is unusual. So, Graham, just to, to finish off, is there any sort of specific memory that stands out for you uh, as being a moment um, mm. in your filmmaking where you, where you were just like, wow, I'm, I can't believe this is happening? Yeah. Yeah, I think the memories are also encounters with animals and not films, ironically. Um, and like I was showing you earlier, two clips spring to mind, or two events in my brain spring to mind. The one is when I was able to actually get a dorsal ride on a big great white shark um, on just one of those exceptional days. The ocean was calm and clear, which is unusual down in the Cape. And um, the shark swam past me. I actually had a camera, but I just held on to its dorsal yeah. and it dragged me along for... It felt like a long time, but when I look at the clip, it's a couple of meters. But you know, to have your hand on the dorsal of a white shark looking over the front of its head and it's, yeah. it feels your weight and it takes you and it doesn't bolt. It drags you yeah. along. It's quite an amazing Incredible. experience, eh? I don't think I slept that night. <laughs> and then the other one is the biggest, probably the biggest croc that we encountered on a scuba dive in the Delta. Um, we found it under the recess of a papyrus bed and... Uh, my colleague and I were filming across each other and uh, I remember I was almost straddling its tail and this thing stood up underneath me and just walked across the bottom into this tunnel, this dark tunnel. And uh, that was, you know, I think for me the appeal is that I knew, pretty much certainly, that nobody else on earth was doing that at that time. Sure. <laughs> and for some reason that gave me a lot of kicks. Um, but also just looking at those crocs and, and understanding that they don't, you know, there's a lot more going on in their brains than, than we think. A lot more um, forgiving and tolerant and calculating. Mm. And um, yeah, which, is, which was a surprise to me initially, but not so much anymore. Yeah. I think we have a lot to owe to, to people like you for taking us to places that we can't go, mm. to being able to experience wildlife like mm. that through your eyes and through your lens yeah um it's an it's an amazing privilege of that we have today it is it's it is nice and that was always the goal when i started but i'll tell you one thing for sure eh? sitting next to a fire in the bush felt there's no movie that can that can give you that yes. feeling really uh, i've got to be honest and so um, you've got to watch and then you've got to go yourself 100 percent. yeah and you know where we live a lot of people immigrating, they can't do that anymore. We've got to keep doing it. Eh? And even if you make a little fire in your garden, sit there and listen to the night jar, or, you know, it's just sort of wakes up part of your soul. You know, it's hard to describe yes. that feeling you get, but you definitely get it. Yeah, and I think if that's a little bit of that in the films, then yeah, I think I'm winning. Yeah. And I think you definitely are. Yeah. Thank you, Graham. Thank you Pleasure. so much for, for just giving us a small insight into, mm. into the world that you've experienced. And yeah, thanks for we, having me. We're privileged.